Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for our free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk, create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Sri. Sri, are you ready to join the mission? Absolutely. So- uh, I'm excited to have you on and, you know, have learned a little bit about you from listening to the interviews about you on other podcasts. So uh, I'm excited to have you on. And let me just introduce you to the audience. Sri is the founder and portfolio manager of SVN Capital, a Chicago-based concentrated, long-only, global equity focus fund. After graduating from University of Chicago, Sri worked as an investment banker for a few years before moving over to the buy side. Sri describes his investment style as value investing with a quality overlay. Sri, take a minute and tell us about the unique value you are bringing to this wonderful world. Absolutely. Um, Andrew, first of all, uh, I should thank you for reaching out and having me on your wonderful program. What a fantastic title. Hats <laughs> off to you. Um, I sincerely appreciate you bringing me on. So just as a quick background, I'm originally from India. It used to be called Madras. These days it's called Chennai. It's a town in the Southeast part of um, India. Came here as a student, uh, pursuing my master's in accounting with uh, some plans to pursue a PhD as well after that. But uh, no, I stayed back. I did not pursue a PhD, finished my master's and uh, um, have pursued uh, other interests, including going back to business school for my MBA. And then as you mentioned, um, a career in investment banking and then mostly on the buy side. Mm. Um, to uh, tell you a little bit more, you know, there are millions of money managers, as uh, you mentioned earlier, right before yep. um, we jumped on this uh, recorded version. Um, each one of us have a mission and each one of us are, are here for a reason and we all have a different angle. Um, I would highlight one specific part of uh, what I'm here to do. Um, my investment philosophy is essentially driven by three factors. And I'm going to try and highlight one of them. Uh, if we have time in the end, we'll go to the rest of the, the other two pieces as well. But the one important feature of my investment philosophy is driven by spirituality. I know this is an investment-related podcast and not one focused on theology or spirituality. So you may wonder, where does spirituality come into this? Let's rewind the clock back to 2001. In 2001, at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, in answering a question about how can you tell if you have come across a big idea, because Warren was talking about big ideas that have helped them generate that kind of return. So somebody asked this question, how can you tell if you have come across a big idea? Charlie Munger jumped in and said, that big ideas come to the prepared mind. Question is, how do you get to a prepared mind? Through my experience in the industry, I've always thought that investing is an individual sport. Mm. In, a, in a book titled uh, The Money Game by Adam Smith, not his real name, his real name is George Goodman. Um, he says that the most important thing that you need to know is yourself. If you don't know who you are, the market is an expensive place to find out. <laughs> How do you find out who you are? For me, the answer to both questions is through spirituality, not just a matter of sitting in a pretzel position, meditating, but uh, a constant uh, self-inquiry. Um, you know, a big impediment to uh, most things in life is ego, particularly in the world of investments. This is an even more pronounced factor. 
And I find the exercise of self-inquiry helps me keep my ego in check. Mm. This gives me the patience and allows me to take a long-term approach to most things in life. And this factor runs through all aspects of SV and capital. That's interesting because, you know, um, when I talk to young people these days, uh, well, here, here's an interesting one. I, I did a CFA ethics course at the local university here for undergraduate students in finance and accounting. I had 100 students in the class, and I asked them this question. How many of you, raise your hand, how many of you are not addicted to your mobile phone? And I also gave a presentation, uh, a, a company flew me down to Phuket to give a presentation to their regional managers. They all flew in from Philippines and you know uh, Indonesia and Singapore, Malaysia to Thailand to a nice resort island. There were 75 of them and I was speaking and I asked them the same question. Raise your hand if you think you're not addicted to your mobile phone. So the question is, how many people raise their hand? How many people you think of the students raise their hand to say, I'm not addicted to my mobile phone? What would you say, Sri? Based on what I know about your part of the world, I'd say zero. You're correct. You know this part of the world well. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrifying. Did yes. not, not even one attempted to claim now you could say there was some perception, you know, issue, and maybe they're perceiving themselves as addicted, and they're not in fact addicted. That's possible. So maybe you could say maybe five percent or even ten percent of them are not. But still, even if you did that adjustment, you're talking about ninety percent. Yeah, yeah. So it's between ninety and hundred. Now let's go to the senior executives from around the region. Successful people born in a different era in many cases where the mobile phone wasn't in their hands as a very young kid. How many of them do you think said that they're not addicted to their mobile phone? Again, I would say zero. You're correct. So this information I like to share with people all the time to try to help young people realize that it's getting easier and easier to build a competitive advantage in this world. Yes. Stop, yes. get rid of the mobile phone, reduce the use of it, stop the focus on the immediate satisfaction or gratification because that immediate gratification that's being delivered to you on that mobile phone is so addictive that even people like even people like myself and other older people who didn't have that in their youth can get quickly and easily and can't get off it. They can't kick the habit. So if you're a type of person that can put aside your mobile phone or also think long-term, then you are in a competitive advantage. In fact, you could, you could possibly rule the world in 20 or 30 years from now, the way attention is getting reduced, reduced, reduced. So I think that that is an aspect of the spiritual nature, the internal nature. And therefore, that also means that if everybody's addicted to their mobile phones and everybody's running on this really fast treadmill, there's no difference. You know, with people investing in the stock market, they're they're chasing their tails just as much and more and more and more every single day, month, year. And now, you know, just one of the examples is when I started my career in 1993 as a sell side analyst, nobody would ever say, well, it depends on what the Fed says. Right. Nobody gave a crap about what the Fed said. We had a free market. Anyways, um, what are your thoughts on that? Right. Absolutely. I've got two comments. One, um, I just recently finished reading a book titled How to Calm, How to Calm Your Mind. The author is, his name is uh, Christopher Bailey. He's out of Canada. Um, he's written a couple of other books, uh, Productivity Project and um, Hyper Focus. Hmm. It's all about focusing that mind. Uh, but this one is about exactly the point that you were raising. Um, so, you know, so many of us are addicted to this, you know, mobile phones and um, social media. Um, and uh, we're getting farther and farther away from um, what helps us lead a very productive life. 
And so the book is about how there is more fun in analog as opposed to digital and to help us um, along the process his one of his recommendations is to savor the moments mm. every single experience when you savor the moment you slow things down and um, you become part of you you move more towards the analog part of the world in any case it's a good read uh, it's a more recent uh, release from him the other point that you also raised, which I wanted to comment on, is it's absolutely true that um, particularly in the world of investing, we live in a world of 24 by seven news channel, um, you know, social media, the number of apps popping up um, keeps increasing every day. And uh, we all become highly informed, whatever that means. If you go back to 1960, for example, an average S&P 500 stock was held by the investor for, a, for approximately four years mm. on an average. Today, it's less than eight months. You know, thanks to high frequency trading, uh, many other news channels and, uh, and all that, we all get worked up about the Fed, about, you know, uh, yeah, there are real threats. The war is a real threat. Mm. And there are many other real threats. But still, um, if we focus on the quality of the business as opposed to the macro, I think our approach can be a lot different. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I do intend to um, deploy the uh, um, weapon of patience that is in my arsenal very effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I read a great book. Um, I'll have that book, How to Calm Your Mind, Finding Peace and Productivity in Anxious yes. Times by Kiss Bailey. And I'll yeah. put that in the show notes. That's a great recommendation. And um, I read a great book also called Future Hype. And the guy talked about all the different things that people thought that were moving so much faster now. I mean, he just, each chapter just dismantled something that you absolutely believed in before you read the chapter. And, yes. and, you know, and he talked about, you know, I, I, I think he talked about email and, you know, how you, you know, quickly we can communicate. And he, I think he used the example of John D. Rockefeller in 1898 had the daily refinery volume of his Russian refineries reported to him every single day. And so it's like, yeah, is that like new? So <laughs> talks about how the fact is, and I, once I read this book, I made a big change in my life. Once uh, he talked about the fact that uh, that people spend maybe four, six, eight hours in their email all day. And what's the cost of that? And we don't think about the cost of that. Is it really an advancement when it comes with so much cost? And that stopped me. I mean, basically, I I really don't spend much time at all in my email. I'd say on average, I spend probably 10 minutes a day in my email and I reply to everybody. They get a fast reply. I just don't do it with my labor. And so I learned that lesson. And that brings me to the mobile phone. There's all kinds of advancements and everybody likes to say, yes, yes, I've got this phone. I've got this phone. It's got more computing power in my pocket than my parents had in a desktop computer. Yeah, but did you did you calculate the cost of addiction? Right, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a uh, great, you know, things to think about. Um, well, that's, that's a great discussion about your uniqueness and the spirituality of it. And, you know, uh, what I want to now just talk briefly about before we get into the big question, just because uh, knowing a little bit about what you're doing, what is the universe of stocks that you're looking at? You, you're, you know, you're investing globally. Um, does that mean every country in the world? Does that mean every developed country in the world? Does that mean every developed and emerging or frontier? Or does that mean every company uh, that's above 5 billion US dollars? Or how would you describe kind of your universe? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I say global, but um, yeah, there's definitely some caveats in there. Um, I was trained as an accountant, CPA. I did CPA equivalent program back in India as well. And so I understand, I think I understand the language of business mm. and that's accounting. So um, there are many accounting regimes around the world. 
you, in US, we use generally accepted accounting principle. And the other popular one outside the US is IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. So, and there are other um, accounting regimes. Uh, I know there's one in Malaysia, there's one in Mexico, even though Mexico follows IFRS, they all have their own local accounting mm. regimes. Um, I don't want to understand all these accounting languages. Um, I sort of am familiar with US GAAP and familiar with IFRS. So US GAAP is only for the United States. And I go after other countries where IFRS is the only language. But then there are 110 countries that follow IFRS. And I need to be able to uh, bring it down to a reasonable few. Mm. And uh, so I overlay a couple of other constraints. Number one, you know, around the world, we still have um, regimes that um, expropriate private wealth, private assets. We've seen that happen many times in Latin America, um, you know, uh, sort of has happened in uh, Russia now. Um, so I want, you know, I want to be in countries where I can understand personally. My understanding may very well be different from your understanding. So be it. But I want to be comfortable in a particular country where I can appreciate the IP rights, um, the governance and IP rights. So that's number one. And then on top of it, you know, you have a number of European countries, Japan, um, they all follow IFRS and they have some, you know, excellent uh, local regulations and property protection and all that. But um, Japan files all its financials in Japanese. Mm. I don't know Japanese. I don't know, um, you know, Spanish or um, Italian. So there are countries where, they have this IP laws, but have local language limitations. So I avoid those. I want I want to be able to spend time reading the English version of their financials, appreciating and understanding that, and uh, don't want to spend time or money translating stuff. Yeah. So that sort of all whittles me down to a reasonable few countries. Uh, so that's the macro picture. Yeah. And uh, on top of it. Uh, I don't have a size restriction in terms of market cap or anything. Mm -hmm. What I am interested in is truly uh, high quality businesses. What do I mean by high quality? There, I bring in a few quantitative measures. I want to be, um, you know, when I deploy capital, when I, I manage other people's money, mm -hmm. my objective is to uh, double the capital over business cycle. In the U.S., a business cycle is about five to seven years. And if you translate that into numbers, it's about 11% to 15% return a year. Mm. Um, so uh, that's my objective. So to get there, I want the underlying businesses to be generating at a number that's much better than 15. So I want them to be generating high return on incremental capital not just the high return, but I also want them to be able to redeploy, to reinvest, to generate similar kind of returns. Mm. So that's where much of the uh, machinations happen on my computer. Um, I, you know, I try and understand the quality of the business through that quantitative angle. Qualitatively, I want to understand who the competition is because any business for that matter, what's the one factor that's consistent, that's constant over time? And that is uh, reversion to me. So a business generating high return on incremental capital uh, will automatically attract competition. But there are a few businesses around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world that, that are able to um, consistently uh, put off, defer such reversion to me. So if you dig in and find out what they what the primary factor is, it's typically their competitive edge. Mm. These are monopolies and duopolies, and um, um, you know that are able to consistently pass on the additional cost even in an inflationary period, and generate healthy returns and reinvest. So that's the quality part of the business. And then um, I want the businesses to be run by 
um, honest, competent management teams. Typically, I see them in owner-operated businesses. Actually, I need to sort of provide a caveat in there too, because owner-operated is, or high ownership interest means one thing here in the US. It doesn't necessarily mean the same thing in Asia. Mm. I've seen that play out in China, in India, many other countries. So it's a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of a nebulous factor, but I use that as a, as an important criteria for me. And then finally, obviously, I don't want to overpay. I want to pay a reasonable price, as Buffett has mentioned, pay a fair price for a wonderful business as opposed to a wonderful price for a fair business. So, uh, you know, those are my those are my criteria. So, whittle down the global into a select few, and then overlay that with these quantitative and qualitative measures. Let's say that you you look at your universe that you've described that you know has you know proper accounting that you like. There's no a history of appropriating of assets. They've got you know intellectual property right protection. They're filing their financials in English, and you know that that narrows things down. And you've got a universe of some number of companies, and then we look down at your other criteria, things like you know the growth, the incremental capital the management, the competition and that. <clears throat> and now you come down to really what I would call like an eligible pool that you could yes. that you could build your portfolio out of. And any one of these companies would be worth your time to spend some time to think about. And let's say they're they're on the short list and that you're watching them. <clears throat> is that is that a thousand companies or is that a hundred companies? Before we talk about getting down to your portfolio, the step before that, how many companies do you think kind of fit your criteria out there? It's just about, I would say, about 25 to 30 companies. That's it. Mm. So, I, you know, let me actually, pro, you know, provide you a, a little bit of a digression, if you don't mind. Yep. Um, back in 2017, uh, yeah, 2017, um, there was a professor by the name of Hendrik Bessenbinder. I'm not sure if you have come across. I recognize um, that, but. You recognize that name. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, Hendrik Bessenbinder, um, he teaches at the Arizona State University here in the U.S. He released a paper with a very provocative title, Do Stocks Outperform Treasuries? Um, you know, generally speaking, we would all say, yeah, absolutely, stocks outperform treasuries. You know, what sort of a question is that? That's why I said it's a provocative title. Mm. But uh, he went on to kind of um, dig in, he went back to 1926 and brought it all the way back into the mid 2010s. Um, and um, he said um, barely 4% of the stocks accounted for all the gains in the U.S. stock market barely 4%. Incredible. Um, and uh, and uh, and so there is an outfit out in Scotland, Bailey Gifford. They yep. came across this paper and they mm. said, uh, uh, Professor, do you mind, we are a global investor, do you mind running the same exercise on a global scale? He came back, did the work, he came back and said, barely 3% of the stocks you know, beat the, uh, uh, you know, provided the uh, returns over that long a period of time. So if you sort of keep that in the back of your mind and, um, um, you know, ask this question, why do 96 or 97 percent of the stocks underperform? And that's why I mentioned it's the reversion to me that sort of, uh, you know, competes away any sort of advantage. Uh, these businesses have. But at the same time, when you go uh, look at certain specific businesses, either because of the monopoly or the duopoly positions they have, or some sort of an edge, uh, some of the luxury businesses, for example, enjoy that as well. You know, they're able to pass on the cost, they're able to consistently produce returns at a um, very healthy clip and reinvest. Um, so yeah. that's the that's the key. That's the reason. 
So I'll have a link to this <clears throat> research paper in the show notes. Uh, it was originally published in the Journal of Financial Economics. And yeah. uh, he wrote this in 2017 and then revised it in 2018. Uh, yes. And <clears throat> had, I just found it on SSRN where I often go for papers. He's had about 42,000 downloads from it. And here's what he says in the abstract, which you've obviously remembered very well. But it says, four out of every seven common stocks that have appeared in the CRISP database since 1926 have lifetime buy and hold returns less than one month treasuries. So four of every seven, you would have been better off investing in treasuries. That's more than 50%. Yes, and then, and then he said, when stated in terms of lifetime dollar wealth creation, the best performing 4% of listed companies explain the net gain for the entire U.S. stock market since 1926, as other stocks collectively matched T-bills. Goodness gracious. Yes, yes. Well, you've Fabulous given my reading paper. homework. Fabulous paper. Let me also make one more comment. This is just a comment. Yep. Um, you know, at Berkshire Hathaway, Buffett and Munger have recruited two younger gentlemen to run the portfolio along with Buffett. One of them is Todd Combs. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was at uh, Columbia University recently. Um, I want to say just a few months ago. And he was having a chat with uh, one of the professors um, who runs the value investment course at Columbia. And Todd was just sharing some of the uh, back and forth with Munger and Buffett and it was a fabulous conversation. But um, uh, at one point he said, um, Munger asked me, Todd, how many or what percent of the businesses do you think within S&P 500 will remain high quality five years out? And um, you know, you're talking about the largest 500 companies in mm. the U.S. And Todd said uh, approximately 5%. Munger came back to him and said, I think it's going to be less than 2. 2%. 10 companies. Um, I mean, that's just the uh, that's just the way they think. That's just, you know, And I absolutely agree. Um, so how do you... Um, when you look at that, I mean, I just find what you're talking about very fascinating. So I have to excuse myself for asking a lot of questions before we get to our big question. But uh, how the problem that you face when you do this, right? And you come down and you look at, let's say, a global universe. And let's say that you put pretty tight criteria and you also know that 4% of stocks produce almost all the returns. So there's no sense in messing around with much. So let's say you've got a universe of, 20 to 50 stocks and that's it. And my problem that I face, and I know a lot of people face is that, come on, all those stocks are well known and they're really expensive. It's not like you're going to find that, you know, gem to be, you know, trading at half of book value and six times PE. So how do you deal with the valuation aspect of great quality companies? Yeah. So fantastic question. It's a question that I wrestle with every day. I sort of try and articulate it to my friends as well and um, articulate it to myself first. So yeah, valuation is a very important piece of, the, of my criteria as well. Um, but um, I've made that, you know, over time, I've made that transition. Years ago, when I was getting trained in this business, late Mr. David Heller, the founder of one of the firms I worked for, Advisory Research, he used to grill into us that the first and foremost piece is how cheap is the stock? And cheap defined as low price to tangible book. Uh, but it worked for a period of time, at that time in the mid 2000s. And, um, uh, and so I used to start off my analysis with valuation. Over time, I've had to unlearn a few things from my past and relearn some important lessons. And that is not to lose sight of a very important criteria, which is valuation, but not to put that on top. Mm. When I put that on top, 
many quality businesses do not open their doors. When I focus on uh, quality the way I defined it, you know, high return, high reinvestment, and owner owner operated, many uh, quality businesses are then available for evaluation. Keep valuation as the fourth factor. The first one is it's got to be a business that I can understand. There are many businesses I don't. I don't go into oil and gas or Bitcoin or biotech. Avoid all those, but um, uh, there are many that I do understand. And so this is the fourth of the four uh, investment criteria that I use. Mm. And within that, um, I again go back to Charlie Munger's comment. Um, years ago, he made this comment about how even if you paid a very low multiple on a business that is generating, say, you know, 6% return on capital, but you picked it up at two times earnings or, you know, at a very incredible, very attractive valuation. You hold it for a long enough period of time, you're going to generate the same return that the business generates. On the other hand, you look at a business that's generating 20 plus percent return on capital, and you do end up, say, paying up for that business. You hold up, you hold that stock for long enough period of time, you will end up generating the return of the business itself. Mm. So that sort of a statement is in the backdrop as I think about uh, valuation. But, um, um, you know, time horizon combined with this unique uh, feature of competitive edge um, resulting in return on capital that, you know, that is well north of 15, 20% with little to no debt. And that's a very important factor. I'm looking for businesses that are self-funding. I'm not looking for businesses that need to use some form of outside capital. Um, I don't invest in banks, for example. Banks, by definition, are levered eight to 10 times. And I'm sure you've seen all the recent uh, blow-ups in the United States and in Europe. Um, so avoid those, you know, avoid businesses or balance sheets with debt. Mm. You know, go after businesses that are self-funding. And... Um, uh, you know, I own I own a couple of them in Poland, for example. One of them reinvests 100% of the free cash back into growing its store base. Mm. That's a wonderful concept. It's a wonderful uh, capital allocation mechanism. Yep. All right. Well, what a great introduction. We've learned a lot, but now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah. So um, again, this is a wonderful title. I have to congratulate you on coming up with a fantastic uh, title for your podcast, The Worst Investment Ever. Well, we don't want to be frozen by our past mistakes. I think we do need to be able to learn the lessons and try not to make the same mistakes. So uh, actually this reminds me of uh, of another book by this gentleman, Thomas Phelps. Not sure if you've heard of Thomas Phelps. He wrote a very popular book titled uh, 100 to one in the stock market back in 1972 or 73. Hmm. He said, um, Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. I've had a great deal of experience. That's what he said. I have a ton of experience too. Um, You know, like many of us, uh, I've made both types of mistakes. Uh, I continue to make mistakes, I think. Uh, But the both types of mistakes are, you know, mistake of commission and... uh, mistakes of omission. As I started thinking about your podcast, I kept going back to errors of commission, investments that turned out to be disasters. However, when I compute the quantitative impact of the loss, which is how I 
thought about answering this question. The bigger mistake is an error of omission. Mm. That is, after studying a particular business, I decided not to invest in it for a variety of reasons. Let me give you the specifics. Uh, back in 2009, for example, I was in, employed, I was an analyst in the PM at a company here in um, Chicago called Advisory Research. And uh, back in 2009, um, as the economy was struggling to come out of the real estate centered malaise, I spent some time studying this company called Copart, Copart Inc. Now, uh, this is the largest salvage yard company in the US. The business is pretty simple. You know, when a vehicle on the road gets into an accident, the dinged and the damaged vehicles are hauled to a salvage yard. Uh, the insurance company which covers that vehicle will quickly decide if they're going to pay the policyholder for repairs or total the vehicle and call it, you know, and send it to the uh, salvage yard. There is a quick math that they can run. That's how they decide. But uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, complexity in the car, um, the type of electronics that go into it, labor costs, many other reasons, more and more insurance companies are choosing to total the car and send them to the salvage yard. But then what happens uh, to these vehicles from the salvage yard? Well, the yard owner will auction these vehicles and there are buyers, buyers around the world. Um, buyers will buy these to buy, get the parts and fix up their own vehicles or just pull the parts and sell just the parts and things like that. Um, so in any case, Copart is the middleman um, you know, it gets paid from both sides, the insurance company, which wants to get rid of the vehicle. And then the buyers who are buying this from, um, you know, from the salvage yard itself. So essentially think of this as a, uh, eBay of dinged and damaged vehicles, mm. you know, right from its early days, um, the company was founded in the, uh, late seventies, early eighties out of one salvage yard in California. How do you spell the name? Uh, Copart, C-O-P-A-R-T. Okay, got it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, from its early days, the founder, Willis Johnson, he had decided to actually own the land on which these salvage yards operate, as opposed to what? As opposed to leasing the land. Now, you know, given the real estate, um, given that real estate was the epicenter of that 2008-9 um, great financial crisis, there were a lot of businesses that were really, really cheap. Uh, I wanted to see if at that price, stock was, you know, the market cap was about 350 million at that time. At that price, I would be paying for just the land, you know, all the salvage yards that they had. They had about 140 yards around the country. I'd be just paying for the land and I would be getting the uh, operations for free. That's the hypothesis I was working off of. Did all the work, I came to a conclusion, no, at that price, I still have to, uh, I'm not just getting the land, but I have to actually account for the operations as well. So again, you have to put yourself back in 2008, nine, when the fear was palpable and everything was cheap. Um, since I couldn't come to that, Conclusion, I decided to move on. There were lots of other opportunities. Over time, as the economy uh, improved and the business improved, uh, companies' earnings and cash flow improved as well, and stock uh, price reflected that. That improved quite a bit as well. Um, I was just on the sidelines watching the stock rip. Um, by 2020, the stock was up 10x from 2009. And um, none of the other permission mistakes that I have made come close to this kind of a loss, this kind of a mistake. Hmm. 
Yeah, it's interesting because I went to the website of the company and it says uh, their latest results announcement. It says for the six, I'll just look at six months. For the six months ended January 31st, 2023, revenue was $1,850 million. Gross profit was 800000 So almost a 50% gross profit margin, uh, let's say. Uh, and... The net profit was five hundred and forty million. So we're talking about net profit of about twenty percent or so, roughly. Yep. Which is incredible, given that my calculation of the average net profit margin globally is about six percent over the past twenty years. So through the ups and downs of the different cycles, you could say a good company in a good industry maybe ten percent. But to see this is pretty incredible. So what what are the lessons you learned you learned from this? Yeah, there were quite a few actually. Um, one important lesson is that the qualitative strengths of the of a company are not readily apparent in the financials. You know, for example, in this business uh, of salvage yards, essentially there are only two major players. You know, Copart has close to 55, you know, unofficially even north of that sort of percent market share. And um, the second public company, which is actually in the process of being acquired now, it's a, much, it's a smaller piece, 35 so percent. And then there are a few um, mom and pop operators around the country. So the qualitative uh, uh, strength here is the competitive edge. Um, essentially, this is a duopoly, and um, to a certain extent, because of what the second competitor is going through, it's a sort of a quasi-monopoly, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Peter Thiel, in his in his book, Zero to One, um, he said this nicely. You know, competition is good for capitalism, but not good for capitalists. With limited competition. The moat here is immense. Mm. That was that was one uh, big mess. The yeah. other big mess is um, the strength of the management team. I mean, um, mm. uh, even today, this is an owner-operated business. Willis Johnson, the founder, is still the chairman. His son-in-law, who's been with him since he was 19 years old, has essentially worked in only one company. Uh, he's the co-CEO today. Right. So it's a it's an owner operated business, and uh, you know the decision to own the land back in two thousand three, they sort of made the decision to make to move the entire auction process to online as opposed to doing it from their salvage yards, um, has continued to pay rich dividends. And in fact, during COVID, when nobody was allowed to go out, this online business turned out to be a fabulous success, and the competitor. <laughs> who was doing it from the salvage yards was forced to switch over to online. So those quality of decisions, again, uh, is not readily apparent, but you can over a stretch of time observe the strength of those decisions. So those were, you know, um, those were a couple of big misses and I could see how those advantages kind of led to strong returns um, and typically, that's what I would say in high quality businesses, mm. those types of uh, not apparent decisions would come out to be the strongest drivers over a long stretch of time. Yeah. And I guess my takeaway is that for the listeners out there, for young people out there, you know, get out and work in business. A lot of people just want to become an analyst or become an investment banker. I mean, all the young people that come to me to learn valuation and stuff like that. They all say that. And I know for me, I went to work at Pepsi, even though I, I I studied finance and I worked in our warehouse and I worked in our manufacturing facility. And I just learned so much about, you know, yeah. so much. And then um, and then we set up our coffee business here many years ago, about 30 years ago. And my best friend runs that. And basically, you know, by doing that, I just became such a better analyst. Right. Unfortunately, I made I made other mistakes, <laughs> but you I have to say that, you know, it just helps you to, you know, so my biggest lesson, that's number one, is really get out there and, and, and you know, it's not all, I think 
despite the fact that I think you you've got a lot of quantitative aspect to you, the the two main lessons that you talked about, qualitative strengths are not always in the financials, and you right. got to really try to understand the strength of the management teams. Those are really qualitative factors, and that's what really makes a difference. The other last thing I would say is just that, isn't it amazing? Like there's all these people doing incredibly interesting businesses and making smart moves. Cause I was just thinking like buying the land of the South. Well, naturally nobody's out there buying that land. It's gotta be super cheap, you know? And these guys that run the salvage places. So like that's their family land and they, they know nobody's going to buy it. And, you know, it just like, uh, and you know what, someone's going to make another salvage yard in, in that neighborhood or in that city. Unlikely. Absolutely. Absolutely, so, they now have like eight thousand acres of land. Incredible, and you know, um, relative to nineteen eighties and the early nineties, the size of these cities have only expanded, mm. and the salvage yards, which were in the outskirts, have now become part of the big city. And uh, competitors, it's not going to be it's not going to be easy to replicate this. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, yeah, incredible. So based upon what you learned yeah. from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Yeah, um, as I mentioned early on, you know, investing is an individual sport, and uh, uh, each one of us will have to play to our strengths. While I was trained in the classic mold of looking for cheap stocks, cheap in terms of valuation. I've continued to evolve as time has progressed. And uh, as I mentioned, I have that four part uh, feature to my investment criteria, mm. businesses I can understand high quality and uh, you know, skin in the game and reasonable valuation. While uh, many investors in the stock market these days uh, start off with valuation as the lead driver um, for me, Again, I'm talking just from my standpoint. For me as a patient, long-term, quality-focused investor, that's the last of the four investment criteria. Mm. It's a small, you know, um, it's, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, saying I'm ambivalent or ignoring valuation. Absolutely not. I'm just reordering the priorities. And that has been uh, an immense help in, how I have uh, grown. So um, <clears throat> you've given us some great resources, in particular that paper I'm going to put in the show notes. Is there any other resource you'd recommend for our listeners? Yeah. Um, you know, again, allow me to quote uh, Thomas uh, Phelps one more time. Um, he said, you know, in that book, 100 to 1 in the stock market, he said, uh, you know, to make money in the stock market, you must have the vision to see them, courage to buy them, and the patience to hold them. And according to him, patience is the rarest of the three. And most successful investors that we know perform at a high level on each one of these uh, variables. Hmm. And, uh, you know, more importantly, people like Buffett and Munger I use them only, be, there are many other investors. I use them only because your audience and many others would be able to relate to those two. Um, and they continue to hone their skills over time. Yep. So how do you get the vision, courage, patience? Uh, it's a question worth pondering. For me, I go back to, I rely on spirituality to help me have serendipity hit me regularly. I read a lot both investment related and particularly non-investment related. And uh, uh, while I'm not smart enough to read as you know diversely as Bob, as Munger recommends to create that mental model and the lattice network, I read within, within a confined area and these have helped me unlearn. Unlearning is actually a very important and a very difficult process actually. Mm. unlearn some of the lessons from my past to relearn some of the new things. So, um, you know, uh, I would suggest the tools would be find out who you are mm. through whatever mechanism that helps you and read widely. Fantastic. 
So the book I'm going to put in the show notes, the book is 100 to 1 in the stock market. A distinguished security analyst tells how to make more of your investment opportunities. I noticed it's available on, on Amazon only in Kindle and audio book. Which one did you? Oh, really? Consume? Yeah. Oh, no, I have a hard You copy. have the physical book. I bought it. Okay. I know I had it. I'm going to have to ago. see if I can find that, but I'll put that in the show notes. All right. Last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Well, given my style of investing in high quality businesses, I don't trade much. Fortunately, we also know that uh, we do not need too many of these stocks to create wealth. So my objective is to find at least one new stock that can be a multi-bagger. Mm -hmm. Just one. That's enough. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. If you've not yet joined that mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com and join my freakly, free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, Sri, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of ASTOTS Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Oh, thank you for uh, making me a member. But uh, yes, I do. And uh, remember, I mentioned that uh, my biggest error was that error of omission and co-part with the company. Mm. Well, during COVID imposed 2020 period, I corrected the er error by adding it to the portfolio um, when the stock got hit by almost 50%. Mm. Better late than never, I guess. That's the approach I've taken here. But um, um, I sincerely appreciate you, Andrew, for uh, taking the time and having me on your wonderful podcast. Well, that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.